Chat with Traders, Episode 3. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. Hey, what's going on, buddying traders? Thanks so much for joining me on the third episode of Chat with Traders, the podcast that brings you in-depth interviews with consistently profitable traders week after week. Now, I'm excited to introduce today's guest, who has well and truly found his niche dominating penny stocks. His name is Timothy Sykes, and it's no secret that he turned $12,000 into roughly $2 million within the space of just a few years making him a millionaire by the age of 22. With that in mind, it's safe to say he could teach us all a thing or two about trading. So that's why I brought Tim on the show today to take us inside the world of penny stocks. Throughout this interview, you will learn how many of these stocks move, some of the things to watch out for, and also the key benefits that can come from trading penny stocks. Make sure you listen all the way through because Tim has a really cool offer exclusive to listeners of Chat with Traders. All right. Let's get into it. I'm Aaron Fifield. This is Chat with Traders, and here is our guest, Timothy Sykes. Hey, Tim, so great to have you here. I've really been looking forward to this, so thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's great. So let's go back in time to how you got started. Uh, you started with a $12,000 account and turned it into a couple million dollars just within a few years, which is mighty impressive. <laughs> But before you made a great success, what was it about the stock market that appealed to you? Um, you know, I just, I'm Jewish. I like playing with numbers. I'm, I was like raised to believe in financial security. So the stock market was always kind of in my life, not for trading purposes, just to kind of know about how it works. And, you know, I wanted to be a, a mutual fund manager when I was growing up. I thought that would be a nice way to, you know, grow a portfolio, get paid. Uh, year in, year out. It was a nice, steady job, and all you had to do was research stocks. So when I was a teenager, you know, I began researching stocks, and I began investing. Uh, for the first few months, the stocks didn't do anything. So I was like, this, this job sucks. Uh, so I got into penny stocks, and they, they really were moving fast. In my account, you know, senior year of high school, I grew from 12000 into 120000 um, which was a lot of money for, for me back then. So you know, it, it was just understanding that you need money in this world. Um, you know, you can be a hippie. You can just say, oh, all you need is love. But money makes your life better. Uh, it's good to have financial security. So that's what really got me into this. Absolutely. No, that's great. So you were let loose into the markets. How did you know what you were doing? I mean, I believe your knowledge was pretty limited when you got started. Yeah, I mean, it was all just trial and error. Um, you know, the, the educational business that I have now is uh, my first thought every morning is to be the mentor to people that I never had because it was scary. You know, I didn't know the rules. I didn't know what stocks to buy. I didn't know how much to use in a position. Um, I didn't understand anything. So I really just learned uh, trial by fire and in, in growing the account. You know, it sounds nice to turn 12000 into 120000 in a year. But I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I, I, I had some basic pattern recognition abilities. Like I, I learned that, okay, this strategy works, other strategies don't. But I would have like 20% drawdowns or 30% drawdowns and, and not understand. You know, My parents thought I would lose everything. Um, so I, I would say number one thing is that you have to start understanding how the market works. And if you can, get a mentor, uh, somebody who, who's going to pass down their lessons over time so that you're not totally lost. Absolutely. That's a good call you make. Going back, was there anything you really struggled with that, that stands out? You know, I mean, I was very fortunate to start right during 1999, 2000. So I had an easy market. Um, I struggled with dealing with all the money that I made really like so quickly. I was like trying to extrapolate it. Um, you know, it, it's like I was comparing myself to like NBA players. I'm like, okay, because freshman year in college, I made 700 grand in like four months. And I'm like, if I can make seven hundred grand every four months, then I'm, you know, making two point one million a year. Wait a minute, Scotty Pippen makes this, and like, I, I just didn't understand that 
where I was in the, in the history of the world, uh, you know, in the world's biggest stock market bubble. And I had ridden it and I had ridden it well. Um, so I was really kind of screwed up in the head making so much money so quickly. Uh, and, I, and it's a miracle that I didn't lose it all at first <laughs> or ever. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not a terrible problem to have. I, um, <laughs> it could be much I mean, worse. <laughs> it could be much worse, but it's also like I, a, a lot of people, uh, you know, really enjoy success over the long term. They work hard to get it. Like you make an equation in your head. You work hard, you get success. I didn't work that hard and I had all this success. So I, the equation was all messed up in my head. I became a philosophy major. I needed like therapy. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so is that when you sort of, was there ever a point during that time when you knew for sure you were on track for great success in the markets? Like it was a realization like that where it sort of clicked and you knew this is what you were meant to do? Uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes like, I mean, o- over time, I've really refined this, this pattern that I specialize in. Um, and every time it pops up, it's like, oh my God, it's, it's happening again. Like I know it, I know how this is going to play out time and time again. And that's kind of crazy because, you know, the, the whole world is, is just basically guessing what the markets are going to do and they don't know. And, and I have this pattern that has worked pretty much religiously for 15 years. Um, even now I teach thousands of people and the pattern still exists. It's still, you know, with these Ebola stocks right now. And just before that, you had the body worn, uh, police cameras, uh, due to the Ferguson, Missouri shooting. So it's really beautiful when what, you know, happens again and again and again. And it's kind of like, I was meant to do this. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about your trading methods and your approach seen as penny stocks, your weapon of choice. What would you say are some of the key benefits and maybe the disadvantages of trading penny stocks uh, versus your more valuable stocks, say five dollars and upwards? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the whole world hates on penny stocks. Uh, you know, they're they're scams, they're evil, they're unethical. So there's so much misinformation out there. Some of them are scams, yes, but you can pretty much spot those. I've exposed a lot of the scams uh, over the course of my career. Uh, there are some good companies that you can buy. Um, but the, the amount of bad and just misinformation out there is overwhelming. You know, when I first got started, uh, teaching, uh, in late 2007, Investopedia said that what I did, namely short selling penny stocks was illegal. So I had people emailing me every day. You're a criminal. I'm like, it's not illegal to short sell penny stocks, but because brokers don't want to deal with penny stock people because there's not a lot of money. You know, the, the people, most of the people with penny stocks are, are investing like lotto tickets. So they blow up. So brokers are just like, no, it's illegal. And they just shove them off. And people come to me and they say, the broker said it's illegal. You're lying. And I'm like, I'm not lying. Your broker just sucks. So finding a good broker, finding shares to short when I am short selling these scams and betting against them, um, that's annoying. But the upside is that it's so easy to spot a scam if you just do some, some very you know, rudimentary research. Uh, and the cool thing about this, the companies that are not scams, they only have like one or two products. So when they do surge, it's very quick. It's very easy. I actually, I just wrote a blog post about one of my students. His name is Polis B. He invested $700 uh, on last Friday and he sold it overnight on Monday. The, the company, they make thermometers. All they do is make normal thermometers, but they got a, an order to supply thermometers uh, for an airport to test for Ebola, which is hot right now. And he bought the stock $680 worth at about $0.08 cents a share. And because of the contract, which has already been announced, the stock was already up from two to eight cents. But because of the momentum, because of the hype, because of the fear with Ebola right now, the stock went to fifty cents the next morning, and he made seven times his money on you know on seven hundred dollars. So he turned seven hundred into five thousand. And and most of Wall Street will look down on that. They'll say, ah, penny stocks, ah, it's a few thousand dollars. But I know so many people who would love to turn seven hundred dollars into a five thousand dollars overnight. Um, so. I think there's tremendous potential, but it's about getting the good information out there as opposed to just misinformation. Absolutely. Now, that's an incredible win. So I guess um, just to sort of shorten that, the, one of the key benefits would be um, that they can move so quickly and the, the low price, they're easy to get into um, for people with smaller accounts. Yeah. And definitely the fact that, you know, there's just not that much information. I, I can't underestimate or overestimate that enough. Uh, because people mock this world that I'm in, 
no real smart people or really rich people are in here. I'm not that smart. And I'm like somehow dominating this little field because it's such low hanging fruit. Hedge funders don't care about making $5,000 in a day. So, you know, I bring up the analogy, if you're going to play basketball, who do you want to play basketball against? Do you want to play basketball against a midget or do you want to play basketball against Michael Jordan? And, you know, I'm competing against midgets and I'm like dunking on them again and again. And it's so easy. And everyone else is like, oh, let's trade Forex. Let's trade all this stuff. Be a real man. And you're playing Michael Jordan and, and you're just losing time and again. So it's about finding easier competition, I think, is a big key to my success. Okay. No, I like that. I like that. So um, just before we move on, what actually defines a penny stock? And where are these penny stocks typically listed? Are, are they on your sort of your major exchanges or are they on, is there something different there? Yeah, I mean, uh, a penny stock is any stock trading under $5 a share. That's the, the basic definition. Some people say under a dollar a share. They're low price speculative companies. Uh, they trade on every exchange, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, OTC bulletin boards, and pink sheets uh, in the U.S. Uh, I like NASDAQ and OTC bull- bulletin boards. Um, it all depends. It's, it's just very low price stocks. It's like if you go to a, a racetrack and you're like betting on like the, the 49 to 1 or 50 to 1 horse, these are long shots. Um, so that's why they're, they're priced so low. And I don't actually believe in any of their success. I'm not saying, oh, this is the next Microsoft. That's the mistake that most newbies uh, make with penny stocks. And that's why they get crushed because it's never the next Microsoft. Um, but what I do is I play in and out of the volatility. And you know, making seven times in a day, that's a little extreme, but Ebola is hot right now. Uh, normally, you know, you can get a stock that's up 50 or hundred or 200% in a day. Um, so there is extreme volatility. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, um, now you put a big focus on researching stocks. Yeah. Um, I've sort of heard you speaking re- uh, previously and I quote being meticulous. How do you go about researching stocks and what is it that you're looking for? Yeah. I mean, with penny stocks, it's either a or B You're either a scam or you're not. If you're a scam, uh, the reason why I'm interested in you is because scams are meant to be, you know, spiked and manipulated higher. Knowing that gives you an advantage because you know that someone behind the scenes is manipulating the stock. If it's not a scam, then the question is, can, you know, their story or their numbers really interest the public to get the stock up? I'm not interested in stocks that go down. I only want to play stocks that go up. And, you know, when stocks go up, I can either buy them if I think the story has room to run uh, or I can short sell them after they're already been manipulated higher. And I think that the story is, is or the manipulation is ending and it's going to come down. So I'm always looking for the hottest penny stocks in the world. And I'm just trying to judge, you know, should I buy them or should I short them? It's pretty simple. OK, cool. I've heard you speak about doing research on a company's SEC filings to help you determine whether or not these companies could be running a scam. Can you elaborate a little more on how they might possibly be a scam? Yeah, I mean, scam, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I don't look to say, oh, what they're doing has violated this section of the, the law, legal code. Uh, but when I say scam or, or pump, it's a question of why do all these insiders or promoters have shares, uh, you know, millions of shares at like a half a penny a share or two cents a share, and then they're sending out mailers or uh, tweets or uh, voicemails sometimes or faxes uh, or press releases, you know, just trying to get the stock price higher. So in the SEC filings, you look and see who, you know, who is it benefiting if the stock really spikes. And what you find is by looking at these SEC filings, you have all these sketchy characters and it's kind of like the usual suspects. It's the same people again and again. Uh, and they hire promoters or, or investor relations uh, and they get the stock up so that they can basically dump it. It's a very simple game. It's pump and dump. So by looking at the SEC filings and just seeing who owns how many shares and at what price, uh, and then you combine that with the knowledge if there's like a mailer out there or if you know 50 people are tweeting the ticker like, new Ebola play, uh, why are they hyping it up? Why is it in their interest to get the stock price higher? And sometimes it's not just insiders who want to sell. Uh, sometimes the company – you know, wants to raise money at higher prices. So if your stock is trading at five cents a share, no one cares about you. The company might design a two week uh, investor relations program where they'll have a press release every single day and they'll get their lowly five cent a stock that no one cares about and they'll get it up to 50 cents or a dollar 
and then do a financing at like 20 cents a share with some institutional investor. So that way, insiders can pay themselves a salary and it's a lot less, uh, you know, less risk of investigation for a pump and dump, even though the only reason they got the stock up was so that they could raise a financing at a discount price and then pay themselves in salary. So it's a pretty evil, unethical game, but it's, it's pretty easy to spot uh, if you just look at who owns what and then combine that with, you know, why are they pumping the stock? Okay. So let's say listeners have one of these companies on their radar and want to look into it further. How can they gain access to their SEC filings? I mean, I just use otcmarkets.com. Uh, it's a free website and you can just type in the ticker uh, and you can type in, you know, you, you go to financials and, and disclosures and you see all the filings that the company has. And whether it's a quarterly report or, you know, any other kind of report, they disclose who owns what. And, you know, if the company has like zero cash, zero revenues, uh, you know, we, they have disclosures that their, le- their lawyer made them put in saying, oh, we don't have enough cash uh, to exist for the next three months. You know, so you have a going concern note. These are all like terrible, terrible companies. Like they have so little, like I have more in my wallet than most of these companies do in their bank accounts. Uh, and yet they're still valued at 20, 30, 50, 100 million dollars thanks to manipulation. And because the people who are being pitched these stocks don't read the SEC filing. So half my job is just getting people to like even use the internet. The Wolf of Wall Street was so successful because he did it pre-internet. You would just get a phone call being pitched the penny stock and you, didn't, you couldn't look on Google Street Maps. I see some of these companies on Google Street View and they're based out of like one company was based out of a barn in Canada. Uh, another one was like this little shack and the, the CEO's phone number turned out to be like a cell phone. Uh, another company, Sponge Tech, which I exposed, you know, this, I think it was the CFO's fax number was the same phone number as the, uh, the company's legal counsel. And when the, the company was eventually busted, uh, they found out the legal counsel didn't even exist. They just had a made-up lawyer. So, like, it's, it's crazy how, uh, you know, sketchy and shady this stuff is. But if you, if you connect the dots using the Internet and just say in your mind, okay, this company has so little cash, so many millions or billions of shares out there, why is the stock going up? And you can kind of work your way back and say, okay, this is a pump and dump. And pump and dumps, you know, are going to collapse. Yeah, so pump and dump seems to be a strategy that um, you've mastered extremely well. So you're profiting, which, which way are you trading that typically? Do you um, aim to trade it up as it's sort of been pumped up or are you shorting it as it's, the stock's been dumped? I mean, early in my career, I used to buy pumps. Um, when I first started, got started teaching, I liked messing with people's minds. Like I would write a blog post. I would be like, why I invested $50,000 in this scam? And people are like, why are you investing your money in a scam? And then that would open the door to me teaching how if you know it's a pump and dump, it's fine if it's a scam. You risk it being discovered. But back then, a few years ago, the SEC wasn't that hardworking. Um, so you could ride the wave up for a little bit. Now, the SEC has cracked down on this a little bit. Good for them. Um, and so now I, I predominantly just short sell or bet against the scams. And I try and be there the day of when it crashes 50 75%. Okay, sure. So now you typically um, day trade, so you're in and out the same day. Is that right? Uh, same day, sometimes like you know one or two days. It, it all depends. Like with pump and dumps, it's tough to be there on the exact day. So you have to look for signs of when the pump is like kind of collapsing. So sometimes I give it like one, two, or three days. You know, I've been early, I've been late. Sometimes I've been dead on. I, I have a blog post where I show four live trades specifically where I'm shorting the stock and it collapses 30%, one of them. Uh, another one collapsed 20%, another one collapsed 50%, and another one collapsed 70% all in one day. And I was short on every single one of them. So it was kind of awesome. Yeah, nice one. I bet, I'm sure that was a good day for you. Um, I mean, there are various days, but it's nice to know that there's justice in the world. <laughs> yeah, so um, how do you define your exit point once, you, once you're in these trades? Um, is it sort of predefined before you get in, or are you waiting for a sort of a signal as it's moving? I actually suck at exiting. Uh, you know, I've been there on stocks like when they collapse seventy percent or when they spike seventy percent in a day. I usually just take. I try and take the meat of the move. I try and make my ten, twenty, sometimes thirty percent, and then I move on. Um, I'm a far better teacher than I am trader, so that's why I think I have millionaire students as opposed to me. You know, I'm, I'm up eight hundred thousand in 2014 in trading profits, which is nice considering I spent so much time teaching. 
but uh, a lot of my students are up, you know, a million and a million too uh, in, in this year alone. So, and they have much smaller accounts than me. So, I, I'm better at teaching. Yeah, that's awesome. Just taking a step back to when you were talking about exposing scams, I've heard you also talk about exposing some celebrities who got behind these. What's the go there? Yeah, I mean, celebrities, they don't know about penny stock pump and dumps. Uh, my message hasn't really reached the celebrities. Um, so, like, people like Justin Bieber, Shaquille O'Neal, um, Carmen Electra, Michael Vick, uh, you know, Rudy, the, the football player. I don't know if Rudy made it to Australia. Have you heard of that movie, Rudy? Um, doesn't ring any bells, but that doesn't mean it didn't make it here. <laughs> it was an inspirational story for me until he became, like, a penny stock promoter. Um you know, they just don't know. They don't understand the game. They, they, the celebrities believe in the products that are being pitched to them. So Shaquille O'Neal, like he got pitched this like Splenda, you know, artificial sugar, basically competitor. Uh, and sh- I'm sure Shaq tried it. He was like, this is good. They pay him a few million shares. He puts his face on the box. And this company, NXT Nutritionals, I mean, used his face everywhere and said, we're going to take over Splenda because we have this amazing spokesperson. And as it turned out, they would pay grocery stores to put their little artificial sugar on the shelves. So anytime a grocery store would sell their product, they would actually lose money because they have to produce the product and they're paying the grocery store just for promotion. And they would do that because they don't care about how many little packs of artificial sugar they sold. They cared about putting out a press release saying, look, we're in this grocery store and that would raise the stock price. Um, So Shaq got involved with that. I exposed him. Uh, he sent me a cease and desist letter, but you know his his stupid lawyer didn't even spell the word egregious correctly. So I wasn't that scared. At first, I was scared. Like I have like this, you know, big like big big NBA player going after me. And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm in the right here. And so we replied. I'm like, I'm not taking it down. Same thing with Justin Bieber. You know, he pumped this company. Uh, it was a cool technology. It, it, it prevented you from text messaging while you're driving. And so I'm sure he was pitched the little product demonstration, like save teenagers' lives. And he was like, cool, I'll, I'll promote that. He used his Twitter. He went on YouTube. He promoted this technology. Unfortunately, nobody told Justin that this company didn't own the technology. They just licensed it. They had no cash in the bank. Seven other companies had licensed the exact same technology. Uh, they were better financed. And the stock went up when Justin Bieber announced he was a spokesperson, and then it crashed. And, you know, that company sent me a cease and desist letter when I exposed it. And I got hate messages like, you know, Tim Sykes, why do you want teenagers to die while they're texting and driving? And I'm like, I don't hate the product. I hate the company, like red flags. And I would list, there's a blog post. I list like four red flags. Like this company has no fucking money. Like what's wrong with you? Um, So the celebrities don't know and it'll happen again because I'm just not that popular. I'm kind of mean. You know, I tell I talk about how like the the party is over with these pump and dumps, and nobody likes that. Everyone's like, "Yeah, Justin Bieber, awesome technology." Don't worry about the how the business actually works. Yeah, we, that raises another point, which I've I've heard you speak about previously. So people think the product matters with these penny stocks, when in fact, uh, with penny stocks, the product is actually the stock. Um, why is that? Yeah, I mean, it's. <sighs> People get pitched or suckers get pitched the product, you know, of the stock and they think that they're investing in the story. This is just classic like misdirection. Um, And I wish more people would understand that. And that's why I teach. I I really hate seeing this misinformation. I hate seeing people with a few thousand dollars to their name. This is why penny stocks are hated. Not because penny stocks are evil, but because the way that they're marketed is evil. And that lures in a lot of people. And, you know, those people hate penny stocks. They don't understand that they shouldn't be hating on penny stocks. Don't don't hate the game. Hate yourself for being so stupid. You know, if you were more informed, and this is what I told the SEC, like I'm trying to get the SEC to do more investor education. I was like, by sh- by halting these penny stocks, sure, like you stop this scam. Another scam is just going to pop up. Why don't you do a whole educational program to investors and traders on how this stuff works? And that way, if they get marketed to. They're not going to fall for it. So you're going to stop the whole process rather than stopping one scam at a time, which, you know, it's never ending. But no one, no one really listens to me. I'm just like the guy who's like, penny stocks are awesome. The bearer of bad news. <laughs> I'm not a fun guy. I tell the party is over. I tell people they have to study. They have to read these fucking 70-page SEC filings. I understand what I teach is not fun. 
That's why I show pictures of my Lamborghini and my Miami mansion. And then, you know, people are happy. So I have to show them the, the, the carrot at the end. Yeah, the results. I mean, um, finance can be a, a pretty, pretty boring topic, I guess. So, um, you know, got to put a bit of life into it. Yeah. I mean, especially, especially penny stocks. <laughs> so, um, sort of getting into a little bit more about your strategy. I mean, I think it's probably safe to say you wouldn't be where you are today um, without some sharp risk management. So, tell us, how do you manage your risk and, you know, go about cutting losses? Um, I mean, you, you just, you have to cut very quickly. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not an option of cutting losses, like just gradually because with these penny stocks, they have, you know, one, uh, you know, big loss and, and they're just crushed. Newbies can get crushed so quickly by believing in these companies. So I'm, I'm kind of like this, this loss Nazi, um, and, and that's what I have to do. Yeah, right. Okay. So, Tim, now that you're involved in the education side of things, where do you often see entry-level traders slipping up and what would you say to them? Like, what's one of their biggest downfalls? Um, I mean, they don't cut losses quickly. I accept the fact that I'm wrong so much of the time. And, and I, if I'm wrong, I just get out. And, and newbies are scared of the stock market. They're scared to lose. But you shouldn't be scared if you're willing to just lose a little, you know, newbies don't think like that. They think like I have to win every single time and that's wrong. Uh, cutting losses very quickly is, is good. Yeah. So, I mean, you sort of let your profits run when you have a good trade and then when it's not going so good, you've got to cut your losses quickly and get out of there. What is it that you believe, um, stops the majority of traders making a huge success in the markets? Like, there's the, the figure going around that sort of 90% of traders fail and that type of thing. Why do you think that is? I mean, are they deterred by the hard work and dedication it takes and, um, or are they just not cut out for it? I mean, what is it? I think anybody's cut out for it. Uh, I think what it comes down to is, you know, just discipline and going in with a game plan. Newbies and, and a lot of failed traders, they don't have game plans. And if they did, they didn't stick to it. Uh, if you, you, you are very, you know, definitive in your plans, I'm no different than a driving instructor. You know, if you're driving a car for the first time and you're not adhering to red lights or stop signs, driving is very scary. You know, you just be driving a hundred miles an hour in like a, a, you know, 20 mile an hour lane and you're not even in the lane and you're going to crash. But if you understand, okay, you need to stop here. You need to pause. You need to take smaller positions. You need to cut losses quickly. If you follow that, then, you know, it's not scary at all. Right. So those are the type of things that should be included in a trading plan? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you need a plan. And that's why I say, like, learn from a mentor, because once you learn from a mentor, then you're good. One of the areas I don't think we've covered just yet, and that is the emotional side of trading. Do you have any tips around this? And in addition, how to keep your confidence up, especially after a few losing trades? Um, I mean, if you cut losses quickly, you're never really in that position, but every now and then I get undisciplined too. Um, I think that what you have to do is just take it one trade at a time. If you do get on a losing streak, then trade smaller, uh, or paper trade or don't trade. Uh, don't try and get all your money back right away and be like, okay, I'm, I'm down, but let me go bigger now because your mindset is not there anymore. Like you, you kind of just had like a bad breakup. Mm, just setting yourself up for failure if you're sort of taking that approach so anyway Tim that's great you've given the listeners a lot to consider and um, heaps of great pointers so that's great thank you um, which is bringing us towards the near the end of the interview but before that let's go to the closing bell so these are just a few short questions and then sharp answers so uh, let's do it sure what's the best piece of advice you've ever received uh, when I was 23 and I was trying to raise money for my hedge fund and one guy was like, no, you have a great track record. You have a great strategy, but you're not scarred yet. And I was like, what are you talking about? I had never lost money, any big amount of money back then. Uh, and he was dead on right. And I, you know, later made a mistake. I, I tried investing. I didn't follow my trading rules and I lost, uh, roughly 35% of my hedge fund. And I go, went back to that moment and I was like, now I'm scarred. Now I know to be conservative. So Sometimes you can say you don't want to take a big loss, but once you have that big loss under your, you know, 
in your belt, I mean, then, then, you, then you understand you don't want to be at that point anymore. And it makes you conservative. It makes you wiser and it's better. Yeah, so once you experience it, then you truly understand what, what, you know, what, what they're talking about. Um, what is the number one trading resource you couldn't live without today? Uh, Twitter. Twitter has gotten very uh, you know, good at, at, at breaking news and, and just sensing where all the traders are with tickers and everything. Awesome. Tim, what's one book you believe is essential for any trader just starting out? Uh, the Psychology of Trading by Dr. Dr. Uh, Brett Steenbarger. I think that's an incredible book. Newbie traders probably won't understand it, but it's very useful. They'll just buy it and you'll read it eventually. If, you're, if you make it past newbie state, it'll help you understand uh, you know, how to control emotions and risk reward and everything. Awesome. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, knowing everything you do now, what would you have done differently come day one? I would have gotten a mentor to start. Uh, you know, I, I learned everything on my own and I learned well and I've done well, but I could have, you know, really just learned and, and made a lot of money a lot quicker. Um, so it's, it's kind of bad. You know, I wish I could go back, but I can't. Now I can just be the mentor to people that, I, that again, I never had. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. So, um, Tim, you've got a special offer for the listeners um, for this interview. So um, would you like to share a bit more info on that? Yeah, if you go to profit.ly slash guru, uh, we have a bunch of different newsletters from multimillionaire traders, not people who are like hired. I hate these like websites that have journalists who pose as real traders. All of my people who are gurus on Profitly are verified millionaires. Uh, and so if you go to Profitly slash guru and you use the uh, code uh, trader chat, then uh, you'll get 10% off any of the uh, annual newsletters. So I think it's a, a pretty cool deal specifically for your listeners. Yeah, no, that's an awesome offer. So uh, make sure you head over to uh, profit.ly slash guru. That's it. All right, awesome, Tim. So again, thanks so much for coming on the show. And um, tell listeners where they can find out more about you and uh, then we'll call it a wrap. Yeah, if you go to timothysykes.com, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff and also Profitly is my website. But just Google me. You'll see some, some fun stuff. You know, it's not just about my website and my trades. I show off my car, I show off my trips, I show off my mansion. That should get you guys inspired to see the rewards of of many years of good trading. Awesome. All right, Tim. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, man. You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but don't worry, more great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders.